Ladies and gentlemen, we would now like to begin the second portion of our seminar. We'll be having a panel discussion followed by audience Q&A. During the Q&A session, please raise your hand and a staff member will provide a microphone so that you may introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you for your patience. To moderate our panel discussion today, we have invited Ms. Abigail Friedman, founder and CEO of the Wisteria Group, officer of the Board of Trustees of the Japan American Society of Washington, D.C., and haiku poet. As a U.S. diplomat, Ms. Friedman has served around the world, including eight years in Japan. She is an awarded haiku poet, having written several books on the matter, and has been a judge of the annual Golden Triangle Haiku Contest for the past three years. In addition, she served as interim president of the Japan American Society of Washington, D.C. in 2018. We are very lucky to have her insight today to moderate this panel. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Friedman and our panelists. Uh, well, thank you all. I'm happy that we all have those excellent cookies in our bellies <laughs> and coffee and tea. Um, uh, let me just start by introducing our panel and uh, they will each have presentations and then I will ask a couple of questions and open it up to the audience. So uh, first let me introduce, I think many of you here know uh, Takehiro Shimada who is Minister with the Embassy of Japan. Um, he was appointed Minister for Communications and Cultural Affairs in August of 2017. So this is the second time around that you are uh, in the U.S. at the Embassy. Uh, prior to being in Washington, you were director of uh, the Japanese Policy Planning Division on the abduction issue, which is uh, a serious uh, continuing issue. So thank you for your work on that area. Um, and uh, Shimada-san joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1991, where he worked on international peace cooperation, China and Mongolia affairs, and a variety of foreign policy issues. Uh, thank you today. Uh, next we have uh, Laura Abbott, a dear friend, uh, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the U.S.-Japan Council's D.C. office. Um, until January 2017, Laura was also the senior, was the senior advisor at the State Department and the Office of Global Partnerships. Prior to that, she served in the U.S.-Japan Council at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo as a Executive Director of the Tomodachi Initiative, which I understand you'll be talking to us a little about later today. Um, and uh, Laura also has extensive experience in Japan. She moved to Japan just six weeks before the Great East Japan Earthquake of 2011, when she was a CFR Hitachi Fellow. Um, and among your many previous accomplishments, you were also uh, on the U.S. Senate uh, Committee on Foreign Relations as a professional staff member. Um, we then have uh, a movie star, which is kind of unusual for Washington, D.C., uh, <laughs> Shin Koyamada, um, actor and producer, CEO of Shinka Group, and also chairman of a uh, wonderful NGO, uh, Koyamada International Foundation. Um, and uh, you're also on the board of directors of Sister Cities International. Koyamada-san was born in Japan and moved to the U.S. for the first time in 2000. He became best known to global audiences after his co-starring debut role in the Warner Brothers blockbuster Tom Cruise film, The Last Samurai, um, which many of us, I think, have seen. I certainly did. It's great. Uh, he became the first Japanese to star in the Disney Channel worldwide hit TV movie, Wendy Wu, Homecoming Warrior, 2006, uh, which was one of the highest viewed Disney Channel movies in the U.S. Since then, uh, Mr. Koyamada has appeared in many award-winning American movies and TV shows. Um, in 2005, uh, Sheen co-founded Shinka Entertainment, an American producer of motion picture films, shows, comic books, and video games, headquartered in LA. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, that um, Sheen is very well known for his philanthropic causes through the Koyamada International Foundation, also known as KIF, a nonprofit that inspires youth and women to achieve their dreams and offers aid for natural disasters. Uh, and lastly, uh, way down at the end, with a lot of exciting things to share with us today, is Aaron Woden-Schwartz. Uh, Aaron is Vice President, Public Policy and Public Affairs of Brand USA. So Aaron joined Brand USA in November 2011, 
where he served as Deputy Director of Strategic Outreach until October 2012. And then he was Director for Public Policy from October 2012 until becoming Vice President in January of 2017. During his tenure with Brand USA, he has successfully established a variety of programs with federal partners that highlight unique aspects of the US, such as our culinary experiences and federal land and waters. Um, Aaron was inducted into the Destination Marketing Association International 30 Under 30 class of 2014. Um, he was also with the Department of Commerce prior to uh, his work at Brand USA. He was a presidential management fellow at the Department of Commerce, and he served as policy advisor to the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Service Industries, where, among other things, he worked on implementing the Travel Promotion Act. So we've got a great panel here, and I think we should just turn right to the presentations. Would you like to start, Shimada? Mm -hmm. Great. I don't think my uh, everything material is on the on the panel. Is this the clicker? Here we go. Could you put the light, my uh, uh, the uh, material on the on the panel? All right. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> It working. Thank you, Abigail san, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Takehiro Shimada. I'm, I'm, I'm the minister in charge of public relations. And uh, one of my important uh, responsibility uh, for our team is helping to advance Japan's public diplomacy in the United States. And uh, we strive to deepen an understanding of Japanese culture, foreign policy, and the value of Japan as the closest ally of the United States. This also entail, entails the promoting U.S.-Japan shared values, democracy, rule of law, respect for human rights, and so on, and most importantly, facilitating the friendship between Japan and the United States. From this perspective, uh, tourism, tourism is a very strong tool for the Japan in pursuing our goals of public diplomacy. For example, the National Cherry Blossom Festival will kick off during an opening ceremony this, this Saturday in Washington. And this is the biggest festival to celebrate U.S.-Japan friendship in the United States. The festival uh, attracts 1.5 million visitors from across the states and, uh, and the world every year, as you may know. So this is the biggest opportunity for the Embassy of Japan to remind the American people of the importance of their friendship. And as you see on the screen, the Embassy of Japan is promoting the festivities under the banner of Little Flower, Big Story, celebrating Japan-U.S. friendship and gift of the cherry trees this year. As most of you may know, uh, the cherry trees will soon join in Washington, uh, originally a gift from the mayor of Tokyo to Washington in 1912. And these trees have witnessed the uh, history of friendship between Japan and the United States for more than 100 years. So these little flowers on the cherry trees can tell you a lot of stories about our friendship. At the same time, I believe that there are a lot of uh, individual stories and anecdotes that the people of the United States and Japan can remember as their own memories of friendship, of love or love, by enjoying the cherry blossom over the years. And our team hopes that Americans, Japanese, and, tourist, and, and tourists from the world to come to enjoy the beautiful cherry blossoms, and they would create their own stories of friendship based on the long history of US-Japan relationship. And uh, as a diplomat, I have visited more than 50 countries, and I have lived in four countries through my career of about 30 years. And I found that in order for us to understand people with different background and culture, it is, it is best to visit and experience countries or places in person. Yes, to see is to believe, just like Ambassador mentioned at his speech. That is why uh, tourism plays a significant role in a public diplomacy effort. In Japan's case, the rich 
topographical variety of island country with many beautiful uh, mountains, rivers, lakes, coastline, together with the clearly defined four seasons, sightseers never get bored. Japan can also attract you with many historical sites and places to experience cutting-edge technologies. And of course, you will enjoy delicious food with very reasonable price. You might get ad addicted to Japan. Another good example of Japan's appeal is the JET program, the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program. Every year in Japanese government uh, recruits about 5,500 university graduates from all over the world to visit Japan to work mainly as assistant English teachers in Japan. And from the US, about 1,000 graduate students visit, visit Japan as, as a JET. And now there are a total of 34,000 Americans people who have worked as JET in the past 33 years. Luckily enough, most of the American JETs come back to the United States with very positive image of Japan and the Japanese people. And even in this town, I frequently come across JET alumni wherever I visit my counterparts in the government, private businesses, and media, think tanks, and others. Thanks to them, we are always encouraged to realize that we are surrounded and supported by Americans who share our common values. Whatever piques your interest in Japan or Japanese culture, I hope that more and more Americans visit Japan and Japanese visit the United States to deepen our friendship and pass through bonds to the future generations. And as you may know, the, uh, Japan will host the uh, Tokyo Olympic Games next year. I hope that uh, um, especially the uh, Americans, especially the younger generation, would come to visit Tokyo and uh, 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 maybe create another story to tell uh, of the new chapter of the friendship of their own. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Uh, Laura? Thank you. Sure, where I'm supposed to be pointing. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, what'd you do? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll hope I have better luck. Um, thank you, Abigail, um, and thank you, Shimada san. So I uh, am Laura Abbott and work for the U.S.-Japan Council. And the U.S.-Japan Council is extremely focused on the importance of people-to-people -people connections between the United States and Japan. As Ambassador Sugiyama mentioned, I think the strength of the relationship is really founded on these personal connections. <clears throat> so I'd like to just talk briefly about some of the work we do uh, to bring Japanese, the United States, and Americans to Japan. We're focused on developing and connecting diverse leaders to create a strong U.S.-Japan relationship. We're bringing people together from across sectors, backgrounds, and generations because we feel that this is the underpinning for a stronger relationship between our two countries. For the strength of that relationship, but also because the U.S.-Japan relationship matters for the Asia-Pacific region as well. We are investing in the next generation through a number of different programs and perhaps the most well-known is the Tomodachi Initiative. So I'd like to just show you a short video on the Tomodachi Initiative and let's hope that the technology works here. The Tomodachi Initiative develops the leaders of tomorrow. On March 11, 2011, the Great East Japan earthquake struck the beautiful towns and villages of the Tohoku region of Japan. We wanted to support young people in Tohoku, so we launched the Tomodachi Initiative. The Tomodachi Initiative is a public-private partnership between the U.S.-Japan Council, the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo, with strong support from the Government of Japan. Thanks to the generous support and partnership of many Japanese and American companies, we've been able to have a profound impact 
on the lives of many young people in Tohoku and beyond. Today our programs connect young people from across Japan, from Hokkaido to Okinawa to young people from across the United States. Since inception, the Tomodachi Initiative has provided life-changing experiences for over 7,000 young people and counting. We're creating a community of internationally minded young leaders that we call the Tomodachi Generation. Yeah, we can cut that air. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so actually, since that video, we've now had about 800 more participants. So we're now at around 7,800 young people. And we're bringing them uh, through short-term exchanges, through study abroad programs, and through programs focused on particular areas of uh, expertise such as STEM education or women's leadership and empowerment. So um, we hope to, uh, that you may have an opportunity to interact with some of these young people in the future if you haven't already. I always find it, I was saying to Abigail, the most inspiring part of my job is getting to meet the young people and hearing about their own inspiration to remain involved in each other's countries in the future. Another aspect of our work is a study abroad program called the Watanabe Study Abroad Program. And this scholarship provides opportunities for Japanese and Americans to study for uh, one year in each other's country at an undergraduate or graduate program. And it was, uh, this is the third year that we've been doing this. They're a very generous grant um, from some, someone whose life was transformed by a study abroad experience and wanted to provide that experience to others. So, <clears throat> Another aspect of tourism that we work with through the U.S. Japan Council is connecting Japanese Americans with their roots in Japan. And the flagship program of this that has been supported by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for many years is the Japanese American Leadership Delegation. And we've now had 217 Japanese American leaders that we've brought to Japan through this program. And I think the ripple effects are many. Uh, and for many participants, it's been a catalyst for them to reconnect with Japan and bring their families in the future. <clears throat> Another aspect that we work on is bringing Asian American state elected officials to Japan. So I think as many of you in the room are aware, there, there's a continuing conversation about history uh, in this country and the history uh, issues we feel are important to bring people up to speed with the current situation in Japan and particularly bring Asian American elected officials to Japan to see what it's like now and have them fall in love with the country which is what always what happens when people go to Japan and bring some of those ideas and fondness for Japan back to their work that they are doing in the regions across the United States. Another aspect of our work is our annual conference, and I think many in the room may have attended past conferences, but I think this is another way in which we can promote travel uh, to each other's countries. So we bring around 750 attendees a year to our conferences this coming one this fall. Um, anyone who is interested, please uh, keep an eye on our website and uh, sign up to come. It'll be in Los Angeles but we do alternate uh, in Japan and the United States and bring a, a great number of interesting speakers together. <clears throat> uh, I'd also like to just mention lastly that we think there's important connections to be made at the regional and prefectural levels and we run a governor's circle that brings together governors from prefectures in Japan uh, to the United States and um, they'll be having convening a gathering in the Silicon Valley later this year. And uh, we've also done regional economic summits uh, in Hawaii and in Texas and trying to connect Japanese businesses with local uh, uh, regions in the United States and recognize that it's not just about Tokyo and Washington or Tokyo and New York, but there are lots of places around the country that matter and want to promote tourism and travel and uh, economic relationships in those areas too. So. With that, um, I look forward to the conversation on the panel. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And
Thank you for the great work that uh, your organization is doing uh, to help young people in both our countries. Uh, Sheen Sun, your turn. Hello, everyone. How are you? I hope uh, you're having fun. Uh, we have a camera, so I feel like uh, I'm in the filming a scene or something. Uh, I'm kind of shy in front of a camera, but I do my best. Um, uh, my name is Shin Koyamara. I'm based in Los Angeles. I am originally from Okayama, Japan. I moved to the United States uh, in 2000, about 19 years ago. I gr growing up 18 years in Japan and 19 years in the United States, so I'm kind of like a hybrid person in the United States. I'm happy uh, to be uh, to be here and meeting new people. Um, after being the movie in The Last Samurai and Wendy Wu Homecoming Warrior on Disney Channel, I've been on the Disney Channel, I have my own movie, and I grew up with this uh, Disney Channel kids. Um, and I was very involved with uh, a charity uh, causes throughout the United States. That's one of the things the Hollywood people do, get involved with the charities very deeply as part of American culture. So I was introduced to that. I was traveling different places, Texas, Washington, D.C., uh, and everywhere in California. In 2008, uh, can I grab this? In 2008, uh, my wife, who near light, uh, TED talker, TED, uh, TEDx uh, talk speaker, and she's from Colombia, but she's American. Uh, we founded our foundation called Koyamara International Foundation, simply KIF, in 2000 in Los Angeles. Oh, oh this one. Okay, great. So we founded in 2008. We have uh, six major programs. I'm going to try to uh, rush this. Uh, we have a global youth empowerment program, girls, women empowerment program. We have a people to people relationships, natural disaster relief, and thousand ways to give, and sustainable development. Um, Global Youth Empowerment, we organize lecture events uh, at the different university. Girls and Women Empowerment event, uh, we do a lot of women-focused uh, lecture events throughout Japan and elsewhere. And people to people, we team up with the embassies and consulates and do a lot of cross-culture and educational event in the regions of Japan. Natural Disaster Relief, we, uh, we do a fundraising and uh, gather relief goods and send it out to uh, affected areas. For example, we did one in 2011, Great East Tohoku Earthquake, and Thousand Ways to Give is a homeless program and promote um, extreme poverty around the world. And Sustainable Development, which you know, SDGs, uh, which is started by uh, United Nations in 2015, we team up with other organizations to promote SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Our mission, um, we're working on short, shortening the mission, but our mission is to improve quality of people's life by empowering global youth and women to reach their full potential and by providing humanitarian aid to promote global peace and sustainable development. So this is one of, one of our programs we did in Japan in 2013 and 14. It's called Japan-US Discovery Tour, which uh, Shimara-san was a big help for helping me, helping us out to organize this event in Tokyo. He was at yeah, based in Tokyo. Oh, by the way, he is the one that uh, uh, recommended me to this event. So thank you, Shimada-san, for the opportunity. <laughs> um, so this is the, we brought, because I was in the Disney Channel, I uh, became friends with a lot of uh, Disney actors like uh, Dylan and Cole Sprouse, and we toured throughout Japan 10 cities, and uh, we reached out about 3,000 Japanese uh, high school and uh, undergrad students. And it was very successful. We, we did a talk show, cross-culture event. We even visited uh, US spaces in different places in, in Japan. And this is another program uh, 
it's one of the program, Global Youth Program. Uh, we have we send different speakers to different uh, national and private universities in Japan to share our speakers' experience internationally to inspire uh, to pursue their dreams and uh, cultivate their global mindset. Uh, this is a Kindai University. So the one, the picture one before was at the Kansai University, uh, and uh, this is Kindai. We've done in Okayama University in Ritsumeikan University. We've done Okayama, uh, Okayama University and Okinawa International uh, Universities. So this is another things that we teamed up with uh, U.S. embassies and consulates, and uh, we did we did uh, many many lecture events targeting youth. And this is a high school, and this is two, three weeks ago. I had a meeting greet with uh, uh, Foreign Minister Kono-san. I also had a privilege of meeting the Prime Minister and his wife. Uh, KIF, we team up with a, we have a global partner with the Sister Cities International, which I was elected uh, as the first time Japanese uh, to be on the National Board of Directors. Uh, which Norma Mineta has been a very big help. Uh, thank you for your dedication. Uh, JCI Junior Chamber International is another organization that we became a global partner. Our thanks is to team up with our global organizations to outreach bigger and bigger around the world. And the lastly, uh, this is uh, next week on on March 27, San Antonio, we have a Japan Texas Leadership Symposium. This is a program that Sister Cities International and KIF and City of San Antonio are, uh, are organizing in San Antonio. This is a one-day event. This is actually sold out. I was going to invite all of you to come to this event, but this is a free event, free food, free networking. Uh, but if you're interested in still coming to this event in San Antonio uh, next Wednesday, please follow up with me and I probably I can help you out. <laughs> Uh, so thank you uh, for your opportunity. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you everybody for being here today. Uh, my name is Aaron Woden Schwartz, and as I was introduced, I'm with Brand USA, the destination marketing organization for the United States. Very similar in many ways to JNTO, and I want to congratulate President Sano on that great presentation. I uh, really want to go to Japan now. Very inspired. <laughs> Although now I'm concerned about you know, competing head-to-head -head in Australia. We've got to up our game. So just fair warning, I've probably prepared too many slides, so I'm going to kind of skip over a couple and, and fly through. But what I really want to do today is to give uh, a little bit of an overview of, first of all, who Brand USA is, how we approach uh, our job of inspiring the world to come visit the United States, and then in particular, uh, what our outlook is for Japan, some of our activities in Japan. Um, and, and then I look forward to following up with the, the discussion on the panel. Uh, so first of all, Brand USA is a public-private partnership. Uh, we were created by the Travel Promotion Act in uh, March 2010. Um, and it's the first time that the United States has had a nationally coordinated marketing effort for tourism to the United States. Um, for a long time, uh, I think the idea was that we didn't need that. People had heard of us. They know where we are on the map. Uh, but, but we saw a, a steep decline in our arrivals after, in the decade after 9-11. Um, and we really uh, realized that we needed a nationally coordinated campaign, both for the country and to help uh, all 50 states, five territories, and the District of Columbia be able to compete on level footing with, uh, with our competition around the world, like Japan. Um, and so you see our mission here is simply to increase incremental visitation spend and, and uh, market share for the USA as a destination. Um, and, uh, and Japan is one of our key markets. I, I would just note that you know, we launched our first campaign in, in 2012, and Japan was among the three markets that we launched that in, along with uh, Canada and the UK. Um, it's a market that is, uh, continues to be a top uh, market for us, a very important market for us, and um, we really, really uh, look forward to welcoming more and more Japanese here. This is uh, a little bit of the travel trends. You can see that, um, like many countries, there was a, a huge dip in the decade after 9-11. Um, I'm, I'm happy to note that that, of course, has stabilized, and, and visitation is, is fairly steady right now from Japan, visitation and spend. So you can see the latest figures for which we have uh, the latest year for which we have figures is 2017, and uh, you know just about 3.6 million arrivals from Japan, and a little over 16 billion dollars in spend. That that actually ranks uh, fourth overall in the world for the United States, and so it's a, a really critical market. Um, and number two overseas, if you exclude Mexico and Canada. So 
uh, really, really important for us. And obviously, um, you know, creating jobs all over this country in communities large and small. I'm going to, like I mentioned, skip over a couple of these things. Um, but I do want to talk briefly about um, similar, similar to the JNTO presentation, a little bit of how we go about marketing the USA. We, we do have, um, of course, our direct-to-consumer marketing efforts. Um, and I'm going to show a little video clip in just a minute. Um, but I encourage folks to, to go to uh, visit the USA.com or, or go USA.jp. Or if you're on your smartphones now, you can look at the Go USA TV app and see some of our great video content. Um, so a lot of what we do is around uh, consumer driven marketing. Uh, originally, we had um, a really nice, high quality 60 second TV spot that we showed around the world, and it was great. Now, what we've really done is started to target our messaging very specifically to each market. And so in Japan, for example, we'll work with you know, major influencers that have a great online following and take them on road trips and culinary journeys and national parks adventures all over the United States. And that's been a really effective way to communicate in an authentic manner uh, to our target audiences around the world. It sort of gets beyond the advertising. Um, another big part of what we do is to work with the travel trade, uh, which are the tour operators and the travel agents and the sort of distribution channels for travel product. Um, this is especially important in Japan, which is a market that still has a, a relatively uh, high use of brick and mortar uh, operations. Um, and so we do a lot of work, of course, with uh, our friends at JADA, the Association of Travel Agents. Um, and uh, we have a team on the ground in Japan that uh, really puts together these opportunities with travel writers, uh, travel agents, product managers at the big tour operator companies, um, and is able to you know, really create uh, new and interesting products so that not only are we welcoming more Japanese to this country, but also uh, inviting them to explore more areas of the country beyond some of the traditional gateways, really getting them out uh, to, through, and beyond the gateways. Um, and then finally, we work collaboratively with uh, all of our city and state partners around this country um, to create platforms and programs that allow them to tell their story. So we'll partner with uh, Travel Oregon, for example, in Japan so that they're able to attend the big trade shows and have their digital marketing through the GoUSA.jp platform. Um, and it's, it's a good way for a lot of those partners that wouldn't otherwise be able to invite Japanese to visit their states and cities to be able to do so. Um, so I want to just show you a, a very brief this is sort of a 30 second sizzle spot that we might show on social media in Japan. It's sort of just one small example. Um, and I again invite you to check out our website for more. Um, hit it again. Oh. Not sure if that video is going to play or not. Um, well, it's an amazing video, trust me. <laughs> Austin is the city of creation. Hey! It is a fantastic environment to make new things. So that is an example of the type of content we've created for Austin, Texas. The, the, the point here is a lot of what we're doing now is really trying to inspire people through authentic local voices uh, or through trusted voices from our target markets. And so that's really been the key to success for us has been uh, really showing that authentic flavor of a place, as you can see in that video, which is kind of a mashup of much of a few different video products that we have, um, as well as then working with those key influencers that people know and trust. Uh, this is a slide that just shows some of our travel trade engagement. Uh, again, this is how we uh, get itineraries and product in the hands of travel agents so that when we inspire our friends in Japan to want to come explore Kansas City, that there's product available for them to, to activate against that desire. So happy to talk a lot more about that as we get into the discussion here. Um, and thank you all for your time. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to have a little haiku interlude here because um, it's rare that I'm introduced in a professional setting as a haiku poet. Um, so I didn't want to pass up the opportunity. Also, today is the first day of spring. Um, and in Japan, uh, all of these events are marked uh, with poetry um, and excellent food that matches the season. So here's a poem by haiku master Kuroda Momoko. 
Uh, I'll read it in English. She wrote it in Japanese. And uh, the haiku is, Rosy pink Fuji greets the heavens, first day of spring. Bara iro no Fuji, rishun no ten ni kana. There we have it. Um, also, before we go into um, some of the um, more serious questions about how to uh, expand uh, our exchanges between the U.S. and Japan, I thought I would start by asking each panelist uh, what your first experience was, if you're Japanese, what your first experience was in the U.S. or vice versa if you're American, and then also what made you come back. Um, so let's start with you, Shimada-san. Thank you, Abigail san the, My first encounter with the United States is almost about 30 years ago, mm -hmm. when I was, uh, I think, the uh, uh, high school or university, university student. At that time, uh, my, my father used to work for the uh, uh, consular general office as a medical attaché. And uh, the, uh, uh, it, there's no, there was no direct flight from Tokyo to the Rio de Janeiro. So uh, I had to change my planes. And uh, LA was the, uh, my first destination to change the airplane. You know, the airplane. And I still remember that uh, when I just arrived in LA, I found a picture of the uh, President D Donald Reagan, welcome to the United States. So uh, as a kid, I was a great fan of baseball. So uh, United States is a kind of uh, country of a dream on myself. So uh, I still vividly remember that the picture of the uh, President Donald Reagan, and it was, it was almost shining. And uh, I, I got the impression that, wow, uh, I just arrived in the United States as a country of baseball, a country of the freedom, and a country of the leadership of the, of the world. So that is my first encounter of the United States. Great. Thank you. How about you, Laura? Thanks. <clears throat> so I just was debating with myself, do I tell the like kind of more honest story <laughs> or? <laughs> so I'm going for a very personal story. Um, so I was dating this guy and uh, we'd only been dating about three months and but things had been going very well and we were getting pretty serious. And he said to me, so what do you think about Japan? And I said, well, what do you mean, what do I think about Japan? I've uh, transited through Narita, but never really spent any time there. And he said, well, I'm supposed to move there in four months, and I'd really like to continue this relationship going. So would you consider moving to Japan? So that was my first consideration, quite honestly. And uh, he was in the military and was um, going to be heading there with his work. And so I had to think about the relationship and about the country, too, because I was working in international relations, but not with Japan at the time. Uh, so I actually applied for a fellowship uh, through the Council on Foreign Relations in Hitachi to uh, try to find a way for work for me professionally to move to Japan and uh, receive the fellowship. And we uh, moved to Japan. We were engaged, actually, and moved to Japan. And uh, six weeks after arriving, there was the Great East Japan earthquake. And I was in a, a 25th floor of an apartment building in Rapungi. And uh, the building shook, and I was scared to death, and I thought this was the end. And um, then when it wasn't the end for me, but it was tragically for so many people, I wanted to do whatever I could to help. And because I had this fellowship um, for the year, I had actually applied for the fellowship to study uh, about study abroad uh, exchanges. And at the time, there had been a big downward trend of Japanese studying in the United States. It was about half of what it had been 10 years before. And that had been a big priority for people to try to change that. So I wanted to study that and work on that. But then after the earthquake, I said, well, no one's really caring about study abroad right now. I want to do something to help. And I had the opportunity to go up into the Tohoku region and work with a group called All Hands Volunteers and do kind of hands-on uh, disaster relief work. Um, and also had the opportunity, I kind of worked with the embassy, having worked in government before. I said, can I help? And I showed up on their door. And they said, just start answering the phones for some companies that are calling us saying, what can we do, American companies? Um, and Ambassador Roos at the time pretty quickly said, you know, we need to harness the energy of these corporations to do something more impactful and uh, more creative than just, you know, giving them the number to the Red Cross or other organizations. And uh, that was really the genesis of the Tomodachi Initiative. And so, lucky or unlucky, I happened to be right there at the time. and. Uh, 
had the opportunity to work closely with the ambassador in creating this longer term public private partnership, harnessing again the energy of the private sector to do something more to help with the longer term recovery of the Tohoku region. And uh, so I became the founding executive director and stayed in Japan for the next four and a half years. And then when I uh, moved back to the States at the end of uh, my husband's military tour, too, we both moved back and I've stayed engaged with Japan professionally ever since then. And so it was just sort of serendipity, but here I am and never expected to be working with Japan, but I love the country and love the people and really have dedicated my um, professional career since 2011 and my life to um, U.S.-Japan relations since then. It's a wonderful story. Thank you. Shinsen, yeah. My American influence, uh, my dad loves American movies. He is a government employee working at the city hall in Okayama. He comes back home with the three, four American movies every day, and we had only one TV. And he said, you better watch what I watch. I'm not going to let you watch your anime. <laughs> Okay, so I grew up watching American movies since I was uh, probably a junior high. And uh, before graduating from junior high, I, my mind was already made up uh, of pursuing my American dream, becoming an actor in, in Hollywood. So I told my parents, can I go to America? I don't want to go to high school in Japan. My parents says, no, you have to at least please graduate from high school. So I finished my uh, high school. Uh, so I, American movie has been my influence, um, and uh, without my dad, thanks to my dad, I'm here in the United States, and uh, I moved to the United States in 2000, June 11, and I was a college student. I came here with a student visa. Uh, I had no friends, no place to live, no English, no money. Um, and I didn't have a place to stay in Los Angeles, but my I knew that I was going to make it happen. And I told my parents before I came, uh, before I came to the United States, I'm not going back to Japan unless I achieve my dream. So I was only 18. And I found my place and enrolled in a college, uh, Los Angeles City College. And I took my acting class in 2001, 2002, 2003. Boom. I got my, my first debut in The Last Samurai. And no, nobody knew who I was. Of course, that was my first movie. I thought it was a student film, but when I showed up on the set, I was like, wow, Tom is here. Well, we had a dinner. Uh, Ken, is, Ken Watanabe is here, and Hiroki is here. Wow, this is amazing. And I was a cast number three, so I was one of the leads in the movie. I had a great time working in the set for eight months, uh, US, Japan, uh, and New Zealand for six months. Uh, and uh, been on, uh, then I was on Disney Channel. And I grew up with the Disney Channel, so I, I can talk about this all day long, but I'm going to pass it on. Thank you. I'm so glad I asked these questions. They're fascinating stories. Aaron. Well, well, we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> Tough act to follow. So uh, I'm also going to talk about movies. Um, I grew up in a, in a really rural area. We didn't generally have TV service and what we had was like six movies that we watched over and over and over again and one of them was Mr. Baseball and if people are familiar with that film from Tom Selleck from the 90s washed up MLB player goes to Japan and uh, goes through all the trials and travails and ultimately you know integrates Japanese culture into his personality and who he is and vice versa for his Japanese hosts and I just thought it was fascinating um, I didn't know if how accurate it was or how sort of respectful it was or anything although I I think it holds up. You guys correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and, and it sort of really, uh, I didn't know much about Japan, of course, but what I could understand from that movie was that there, it's a, it's a very uh, deep and interesting and ancient culture that I wanted to know more about. Um, but of course, I was a kid and didn't do much about it. And, uh, you know, fast forward to probably 2006, I was between college and grad school, and I was in New York City, and I we were talking uh, earlier, I ended up dating a Japanese-American girl and learned a lot more about the culture and uh, hung out with her family in Claremont, California. And uh, it was a really interesting, immersive experience, but unfortunately, I never made it to Japan until many years later. And uh, I first, my first and only trip still to Japan was through Brand USA. We were 
uh, doing the Japanese premiere of our first uh, 3D IMAX movie, National Parks Adventure. Uh, if you haven't seen it, go see it. Um, and uh, that was amazing. Uh, you know, we got to, of course, do our whole big film event. And we had you know, Japanese actors and TV hosts and so, and so forth come out. Um, but just hanging out and walking around the city uh, of Tokyo and visiting some friends in Yokohama was, was amazing. Um, and, of course, there was one night where some colleagues and I and one of the stars of the film, uh, we sort of went out to, you know, have street food and went to a bar. And then next thing we know, it's three in the morning. We said, why don't we stay up and go to the fish market? And uh, so we snuck in the fish market at five in the morning and uh, had kind of one of those epic. We got kicked out three times, actually. So didn't really, I got to see a little bit, um, but apparently you need tickets in advance. Um, so that was my, my first and still only experience in Japan. But, um, you know, I, I'm inspired to, to go back and see some, to see more um, and see more of the country, skiing up north in Hokkaido and going to Kyoto and I'd love to see Okinawa. So it's, uh, it's still an, an amazing country and culture that fascinates me and much more to learn. Great. Thank you so much. What, uh, what I found uh, really ties everything together with all of these different stories is, is the age at which you, your memories of being exposed to Japan or the U.S. Um, you were all, we were all very young. And that seems to me to be the key. Uh, people have talked about that, our um, uh, sort of youth and um, the U.S.-Japan exchange relationship. So, so I'd like to key off of that and ask uh, you, I think I'll start with Laura's, what are, um, what are some of the challenges to, um, to engaging youth, if there are any, um, in each of our countries to get excited about the other country? And what would be some of your ideas of how to overcome those challenges? Thanks, Abigail. <clears throat> So I think there's been a kind of narrative, certainly when I first moved to Japan, of um, particularly Japanese young people saying, I'm not that interested in studying abroad in the United States, and there's so many great opportunities for me here in Japan or elsewhere in Asia. It's closer by. It's sort of easier to get to. Um, the U.S. is very expensive from an educational point of view. Um, and so there were certain barriers to entry, and I'll, I think in terms of study abroad exchanges, the cost of education in the United States is a big deterrent. Uh, I think another impediment that uh, hurts both way exchange is the school year calendar, which doesn't line up. So it's hard for people to just say, I'm gonna take a year abroad or a semester abroad, um, or even the, the summer holidays abroad, it doesn't line up. Uh, and so I know there have been some efforts already on um, the Japanese side to adjust the school year calendar. Um, another element that we hear often from uh, the university age students who are considering studying abroad in the United States it, from the, the Japan side is uh, resistance or concern about the recruiting cycle and year in Japan, which is quite rigid. So if you want to get a good job at a Japanese company, you kind of need to be in the school and graduate with your years of university done in Japan. And there's not, it's not seen as, um, as prestigious to study abroad uh, and have that on your transcript. And it's, uh, if you want to go on to some of the big Japanese corporations and you kind of need to be there for the recruitment cycle. So I think, you know, potentially changing that recruitment cycle or loosening it up a little bit would also help. Um, and I think that for the Americans uh, wanting to go to Japan, I think the culture and um, it is really enticing and people love Japanese food and it's very cool and I, saw the videos earlier about the skiing and things. I think there's an element of cool Japan that really is cool that people get excited about, but I think the language is a huge issue um, for people to want to be able to study abroad or work abroad effectively. Uh, and so it's, it's a challenge on both ways. We need to improve English language learning in Japan from a much younger age, I think. And then um, there's just not a lot of Japanese language programs in the United States. And still, I think, to study and work in Japan, there just aren't very many options if you don't speak Japanese. 
Uh, it's interesting. One of the things that the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C. initiated was uh, like a fast course for people who are thinking of going to Japan, who are already planning to go as tourists, just do a five-day course keyed off of uh, tourism brochures um, uh, to make it more accessible, because I think you're absolutely right. The language seems uh, monumental. Um, but you don't need to have a lot to be able to just land on the ground. And just add one more thing, which is um, we've seen, I, I think this sort of get them young is the best advice. We've seen short-term exchanges just for a couple of weeks for high school students can have a profound impact in the future of their decisions to want to study abroad in university or work abroad in the future. So just a, you know, it's not as scary to go away for a week or two. Mm -hmm. Shimada-san, does this, uh, does what Laura said uh, resonate with your experience at the embassy? Um, what are some of the things that the embassy is trying to do to expand uh, exchanges? Right. Thank you, Abigail. And, and the, uh, in terms of the Japanese language, it is true that uh, it is uh, definitely the uh, uh, kind of in, in, in impediment for the American uh, kids to uh, 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 not only the uh, uh, visit Japan, even also the study abroad in Japan. So uh, from that perspective, uh, we are always uh, extending support to the uh, Japanese language education in the United States. Uh, for example, the, uh, one of the uh, challenge for what, uh, we, uh, that Japan is facing is that even though actually the number of Japanese learners are increasing, but the challenge is that uh, the number of the uh, teachers are decreasing. The, uh, the reason is that uh, in order for the uh, Japanese teacher to stay in the States, maybe you, you, you need uh, appropriate visas. And also, in order for the Japanese teachers to uh, uh, teach Japanese, in, in especially the uh, uh, local school uh, or private and, uh, public school, you have to get the uh, uh, license in the each mm -hmm. state. So uh, that is the most difficult part for the Japanese government to uh, maintain the number of Japanese uh, teachers here. So in order to do so, uh, we always make effort to work on the, uh, each local government or on uh, the, the uh, uh, city levels, county levels, even the uh, state level, to allow the uh, Japanese to stay in the uh, United States as a teacher. And at the same time, in order to uh, overcome such uh, difficulties, we are now st uh, studying up the uh, possibility to encourage, the, uh, for example, the, uh, young Americans like JET alumni, if they are uh, eager to come back to the uh, United States uh, to uh, become the Japanese teacher, maybe Japanese government uh, should have opportunity to uh, train them, uh, ext ext extend the basic training course uh, to become the uh, uh, Japanese teacher when they are in, in Japan. So that is the endeavor we are just seeking for. Excellent initiatives. Uh, I'm going to change it up a little and ask uh, Shin-san. Uh, I saw in your bio you're from Okayama, which is not Tokyo or Kyoto. Um, and one of the things that uh, we've talked about uh, earlier today is the need to um, encourage people to visit the regions outside of the big cities. Um, having come from Okayama, which is not a small city, <laughs> by the way, it's a big city, but, it, but it's uh, probably uh, not the first city that uh, comes to mind for an American. Um, what are some of the things that you would see uh, would be helpful to um, get attract people to go to the um, regions of Japan? Uh, speaking of Okayama, next year we will host uh, Japan United States Sister City Summit in my hometown Okayama for the first time ever in history. So Nomura Minato-san, you're welcome. Please come to our summit. Yes, San Jose is a sister city with uh, Okayama for 50, no, 60, 1957, so 67. So it's been a long time, third, all the sister cities. So uh, I will let you know more details. So it's going to be in October uh, next year. Uh, it's not officially announced yet, but it's going to be happen. Uh, to answer your question, um, I had an opportunity to travel uh, in 2012, I got a call from the State Department and the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo and consulates to do a speech in Tokyo, Osaka, Fukuoka, Okayama, and Okinawa to share my story in the United States. Coming from a small city, well, considerably a small city compared to Tokyo, 
Uh, there are about 700,000 people in the city of Okayama. And they, the government of Japan said, you know, the kids, youth are very conservative of going out and studying abroad in the United States and other places. And I was wondering why. And I had an opportunity to talk to these uh, high school students one on one. We had every lecture event, I have about a 300 uh, Japanese students. And it was surprising how how much they're willing to study in the United States, but it was the society that kind of suppressed. Um, and it, it's also, it was, it was an image uh, of the United States that they see on television. And uh, I told them, I've been in the United States for a long time, I've never been in a dangerous situation. All you see in television is, is, is not what, what is happening in the United States. And it was a very fascinating experience, and and, and uh, these students uh, are willing to take a risk and come to the United States, and uh, they they had their parents. Um, but there are many. I realized that there are so many students in the regions of, the, of Japan that are willing to go outside, but parents. Uh, schools, teachers, friends. I was in the same situation when I was in high school. Why are you going to the United States? You're not going to achieve your dream. Hollywood. You're in Okayama. You don't speak even in English. Why are you going to the United States to achieve my American dream? When somebody, if your parents, um, if your kids are willing to take a risk and plan your lives uh, to pursue their dreams, I totally I encourage you to encourage your own kids, um, and uh, we. That's why we hosted Japan America uh, Discovery Tour. We took Hollywood celebrities to regions of Japan to see what is really happening outside of Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, Fukuoka, in the smaller cities, and we took uh, Hollywood celebrities in ten, ten different cities throughout. Uh, Japan from Miyagi to all the way to Okinawa and speaking of tourism they they have about 20 30 million uh, followers on Twitter and Instagram and I have a uh, quarter million followers too but but for visiting these places they were assigned to tweet uh, engaged in the social network and to to talk about what you have experienced, what you see, what you really think. And these followers around the world are really listening to these role models. And the role model in Japan is a very important thing. Mm -hmm. So through our foundation, KIF, we send different speakers who have different international background to talk about, to share their stories. Um, so they could be their role models and an opportunity to think about, think globally and uh, take the opportunity to to study abroad hopefully in the United States I had a wonderful experience in the United States so so that's my approach uh, social network uh, sent, you know, not only working in the big cities but do your projects in the regions of Japan and they will support and appreciate what you do thank you um, thank you I think my exposure to Japan oh well that's a you know, we love talking about ourselves. Um, I was a little like uh, Laura. I did not really have Japan on the screen, but my husband had grown up. Uh, his father was in the Navy, and uh, he watched um, films on Navy bases all across America, and they were always showing these samurai films. So he fell in love with Japan because of the samurai films he watched as a kid. So he got a job offer in Japan, in uh, Hiroshima, and I thought, why not? And that's how I ended up in Japan. And the irony is my husband went on to do many different things unrelated to Japan. And I, like a you know, rumba vacuum cleaner, just kept going straight on the Japan front. Um, uh, and for me, the language also was something that was key. In fact, one of my language teachers uh, from uh, the State Department is here uh, today in the audience. And um, when I first started learning Japanese, I asked how long it would take at uh, the State Department, and they said 10 years, and I thought, well, 
you don't understand, I'm really smart, I could do this, like maybe in two. Um, when I hit the 10 year mark, I realized that they were right. So, um, but, uh, but the language is, um, the language for me has been, uh, is what allowed me to get exposure to Japanese haiku. It allowed me to um, get exposure to uh, uh, people. I remember going to a region um, uh, closer to uh, the, um, um, now I'm forgetting the towns, but, but it was inland and it was uh, a region facing Korea. Um, and I met all of these older people there who talked about their trade relationship that they used to have in the old days with North Korea. And um, it was th those kinds of insights you can't get if you don't um, have an, make an effort to learn the language because uh, these were, you know, quite old people. They had a long, you know, this was something in their youth. But I had a sense of the layers of Japanese history. And as a diplomat, that was so important to understanding the complexity of, um, of uh, Japan. So thank you for asking. Um, let's see. I think at this point uh, we should open it up to uh, the audience uh, questions. And thank you for starting it off, Secretary Mineta. Um, I have to say that because of the light, it's hard for me to see in this area. <laughs> so if you raise your hand, if someone could come over and just let me know. Um, and there's someone with a microphone. I see a hand over here, so we'll start here. Thank you. I, I, th I think, uh, is this on? Uh, is it on? Um, I think uh, Japan's missing out on a big opportunity, and it's sort of what you might call niche tourism. Um, really highly specialized tours. Uh, I'm thinking railroads, uh, folk art, anime, manga. Uh, expos, my favorite, uh, woodblock prints, high-tech projects, breweries, Shinto faith. Each of those could be uh, specialization tours um, that have yet to appear, as best I can tell, in the Japanese scene. I also have to tell Japan a big secret. Um, there's some confusion about your nature tours because there are tens of thousands of Americans who will not go to Japan and will not return to Japan because of the marine mammal slaughter. And I think at some point, Japan has to stand up and say, we're losing more money to conscientious objection tourists in the US, Australia, and Europe than we're gaining from the cetacean slaughter. I mean, isn't that an issue that JNTO should be looking at seriously and counseling the government at large? That's a great point. Uh, none of us on this panel are with JNTO, but I think that message was heard, and uh, maybe afterward they will uh, be able to have a conversation with you. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, well, we can go on talking. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Just as a point of reference, what's the difference between Japan Tourism Agency and Japan National Tourism Organization, JNTO? Is one government and the other private sector? And if we want to contact somebody about some of these types of ideas of putting together thematic trips, which is the right organization to direct such an inquiry? I would assume the JNTO. Did I get the answer right? <laughs> so, um, again, uh, afterward, we have at this uh, at the front table here um, representatives from that organization, and they would be able to help. So, thank you, and I apologize again for not being able to answer uh, the question myself. But I don't have that answer. So, yes. <笑>ご質問ありがとうございます。えっ、ー、と、JNTO の理事長の制度ですが、
Thank you very much. Uh, the, I'm Seino from JNTO, and, and I would first answer the easier question uh, that it has to do uh, with the, uh, the second question. Japan, uh, the tourism agency is uh, the part of government, so that their activities are rather restricted. And then it doesn't have much flexibility. That's the reason why we created JNTO. JNTO is not completely uh, the private sector organization. We have some restrictions, but uh, we have more flexibility. Well, Japan Tourist Agency uh, the secure funding uh, the, for us, and then we can use those funding for uh, activities. So we have a little bit more flexibility than other uh, uh, the government uh, the organizations. And then if you um, have some idea about tours, please uh, approach us. If you have uh, the specific plans, There are JNTO offices in New York and Los Angeles in the United States. And then uh, there are some uh, people uh, from those offices uh, the, in this uh, the meeting room. So please uh, the approach them and uh, you can uh, the, the contact them later. And then uh, the first question, uh, I think it's a very tough question that has to do with culture and there are a lot of diverse opinions about uh, the slaughtering of marine mammals and some people say that they should be banned but other people say that they should continue its uh, tradition. So and how to uh, the make adjustment uh, the, uh, and then opinions are very much divided uh, so that it's very difficult to uh, find solution to that very easily. We really should start uh, the having uh, the more serious discussion as to what to do with this. Time now, so I want to thank everyone for uh, your patience and uh, for all of the interesting discussions we've had today. And I will turn this back to Mamiko. And uh, let's all thank the panel one more time.